Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with an amazing collection that I'll bet you haven't seen. And it's on Naxos, and everyone says to me, oh, you always do Naxos. And it's like, well, yeah, because they happen to be sort of like the most interesting label out there currently, certainly more than any of the major labels. And they have the most repertoire, and they let me play it for you. And so why shouldn't I spend time talking about them. It's really, really fabulous how much stuff is out there that they've done, often in superb performances. And boy, this is one of those sets that has like no weak links, really. It's astoundingly good. And see, I'm keeping it hidden from you. Well, no, because you've seen the title of the video. This is unbelievable. It's the English Song Collection. This is 25, 25. 25 CDs. Now, all of these were issued separately, and the core of it, the nucleus of it, was some material that Naxos licensed from the debris of Collins Classics. They basically got all their British music, which was fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. I mean, you had Stuart Bedford doing all the Britain stuff, the Britain operas, and it's absolutely first-class material that sounded fabulous, and it's all now on Naxos, where it's have been having quite quite the jolly second life. It's delightful. But 25 discs of English songs by just about every modern English composer you can think of. I think that's astounding. I mean, who else would do this? Major labels aren't going to touch it. But Naxos doesn't do anything to promote these collections, that I've noticed anyway. And I don't understand why. This is one of those reference library boxes that even if you don't care and don't like English song, you get this. You get this and you put it in your shelf. And if you never take it down, well, you know, at least you could say you have it. But if you do take it down, oh my, the results are going to be wonderful. It's kind of fascinating how there are so many excellent English composers of art songs, but they don't get much attention. And I, I, you know, I've been thinking about that a little bit, and I think, I think one of the problems is that when you live in a country like the UK that has a tremendous literary, literary reputation and an amazing literary culture, and let's not kid ourselves, some of the greatest poetry out there, and I understand there are wonderful French poets and German poets and Italian poets, I know that, but there's like two or three of them. England had lots of them. It was something England did really well. But here's the clincher. The best poetry does not always make for the best songs. It's not always the best stuff for musical settings. I mean, Schubert is, of course, the most famous example. Some of his most glorious songs are set to Goethe, who, of course, was no slouch as a poet. But, you know, Die Winterreise and Die Schöne Müller and, you know, the songs by Müller. You know, who the hell was Muller? I mean, yeah, he was popular in his day, but nobody thinks he was a great German poet. What matters is that you write great music and the words come alive. And we're going to see some of that here. We are, actually. I have a couple samples to play you, and they are not all by Shakespeare, which is a really good thing, because the minute somebody sets something by Shakespeare, the entire English literary culture gets its claws out to start talking about, oh, the music doesn't do justice to the poetry. You know, well, no, probably not. <laughs> Chances are it won't. And there are certain things you just should not try to do. Certain Shakespeare songs are written to be set as songs. That's a good thing. But all, a lot of other things are not, and they set them as songs anyway, and they're dismal failures. And even if they're good, the literary people will never admit it. And there's this sort of culture war, this tug of war between the, the literary people and the music people. And the music people always lose because it's England, <laughs> you know, the, the land without music that has lots of literature. So, so let's just consider that as one possible reason why it was only in the 20th century when English songs, really good English art songs, got going. But once they did, just like with English composers and English music generally, it was fantastic. There's wonderful stuff here. So we're going to go through this, all 25 discs, 
you know, rather quickly, just so you know what they are. And uh, we'll play a couple samples, and then I'm going to tell you to get off your collective derrieres and get this box if you give a damn about singing. It's marvelous. And songs in English. It's really, really, really great. So here's the English Song Collection. You get a big, fat booklet with complete notes. You don't get texts. Um, you don't get text and translations, but I assume that they're available on the Naxos website because they, they have all of that stuff there. And the original releases came with texts. I mean, some of them did anyway. And uh, let's see what we have here. So get ready. I'm going to pull out the first wad of them here up through disc 13. Yeah, that's the first half. So here they are. Let's see. We have Walton. Yes, we have a non in love, his facade settings, but not facade, just extra facade settings. A song for the Lord Mayor's table and under the greenwood tree and and other things like that. And they're delightful. And you've got Felicity Lott and Martin Hill singing. I mean, you've got wonderful, wonderful singers in this series. Top-notch singers. It just doesn't get better than that. So that's Walton. Arthur Somerville. You get songs from A Shropshire Lad, which, is, of course, is famous from, from everybody else who also set A Shropshire Lad. We'll get to more Shropshire Lads. And there's Songs of Innocence. And let's see, excerpts from Maud, not the sitcom by Norman Lear. I would love to hear B. Arthur singing these, but what the heck. And James Lee's Wife. And, oh, look, a Fain song. Remember, remember Hulse, the hymn of Jesus, Fain would I this and Fain would I that, the Fains? Well, here's another one. Fain would I change that note. Fain means, we've discussed this, willingly or something like that, or gladly. I don't know why anyone uses that word anymore. Anyway, but um, here, the, here it is, and it's with pa Patricia Rosario and Catherine Wynne Rogers and Christopher Maltman with Graham Johnson piano. I mean, come on, these are this is top-notch stuff, and the Duke Quart Quartet. You know. Anyway, it's wonderful. That's just two. We got to go faster. Vaughn Williams. Okay, we all know this, right? You get on Wenlock Edge in its original setting for a string quartet and, and um, you know, other, other people with Anthony Rolf Johnson and Simon Keenly side with Graham Johnson at the piano. And, it's, and, and you get a bunch of other things too. The five mystical songs and, and uh, you know, a bunch of individual songs. It was a lover and his lass with a hey and a ho and a hey nanny no. Woo hoo, remember that? Okay, Peter Warlock, you gotta have Peter Warlock, you get the Curlew, yes, the Curlew, and Peterisms set one, and Sawdads, and Peterisms set two, and all these other things. Peter Warlock was, of course, insane, and his real name was Philip Hesseltine, and he was like a nut job and a fabulous English songwriter. He didn't write very much. I think he committed suicide, didn't he? Or he died very, very young for some reason, and it's terrific. He was just an amazing and interesting guy. Then we have Roger Quilter. Oh, Roger Quilter. Uh, for 1877 to 1953. Oh, look, he did It Was a Lover and His Last with a hey and a ho and a hey nanny no. Yeah. So in three pastoral songs and to Julia and a whole bunch of other little ones. Oh, Charlie is my darling. Remember that one? Charlie is my darling. Uhuru sings that in Star Trek. To, you know, Charlie the monster boy who, who makes her lose her voice and turns his girlfriend into a lizard and all that stuff. Yeah, that was a good episode. And Holst. Oh, yeah. Holst. You were talking about Holst. We were talking about Holst's songs with the hymn to Jesus. And one of you mentioned that the songs that you really wanted to hear was Beetlejuice, which he pronounces Beetlegoose. It's Beetlegoose from the, the Humbert Wolf songs. And I am going to play it for you. This is with Susan Gritton and Philip Langridge and Christopher Maltman and Louise Fuller Violin. Stuart Bedford is playing the piano. And this has the four songs for voice and violin, six songs, the Vedic hymns, and the 12 Humbert Wolf settings. It's just wonderful. They are wonderful settings. They're wonderful. And here is one of the spaciest and niftiest of all of Holst's solo songs, Betelgeuse.
constant multitude of leaves, no ghost of evil or good holds the gold multitude on fatal good. Cool, huh? It's like Betelgeusean. Fabulous. Fabulous stuff. It's wonderful, wonderful music. And I just had to take this time to play, you know, another work by a composer whose output is so generally disparaged and ignored and who was really masterful at so many of the things that he did. Then we have lots of Britain. We get lots and lots and lots of Britain. This has the Holy Sonnets of John Donne, the Seven Sonnets of Michelangelo, Winter Words, and it's with Philip Langridge and Stuart Bedford. That's pretty cool. And then we have Lehman. Who is Lehman? Uh, British composer. Um, what's her name? Liza Lehman. She began her career as a singer. Damage to her vocal cords first forced, forced her to concentrate on composition, in which she had an inherent interest since childhood. Um, and so here it is. A bunch of her songs. She's her, her dates were 1862 to 1918, and since female composers are a thing now, that Liza Lehman is definitely worth listening to. Very attractive music too. Nice, nice stuff. Then we have Britain again. Can't we have the Canticles, which technically aren't songs. They're sort of larger works or chamber cantatas or whatever you call them. But you get Canticles one through four, and then the heart of the matter. Oh, Canticles one through five. Pardon me. They are all here. And this is with Philip Langridge and Jean Rigby, Contralto, Gerald Finley, Derek Lee Reagan, countertenor, James Judy, Judy Dench, speaker. Yeah, Judy Dench. How super cool. And with Stuart Bedford at the piano, Ozzy and Ellis Harp, Frank Lloyd Horn. It's great to have all the canticles on one disc. There aren't that many discs, I think, that give you all of them. Then we've got lots of Britain folk song arrangements. You know, Collins Classics had this fabulous set of folk song arrangements, and, and this, I think, came from there. Yeah, they did. They did originally. But, oh, these are marvelous, marvelous, marvelous collections and beautiful songs, and a lot of them. There really is six, six volumes, then there's a German folk song and an unidentified folk song setting from date unknown. Isn't that handy? Uh, disc 12. See, we're already halfway through. More Quilter, his complete folk song arrangement, arrangements, and his complete part songs for women's voices. I happen to love all these folk song arrangements. I like Haydn's, I like Beethoven's, I like Britain's, I like anybody who does folk song arrangements I like, because the tunes are wonderful. They're absolutely wonderful. I mean, yes, they're usually about pigs and cows and, you know, and they don't make any sense and goats and, you know, things like that. Generally rural, let's put it that way. But yeah, okay, so what? The tunes are great, and that's what matters. Now, here we go, Finzi. Finzi is unquestionably one of the great English songwriters of the 20th century, and he is the example of my dictum that the best poetry doesn't make for the best songs, because his favorite poet was Thomas Hardy. Ugh. Now, I'm probably not the only person who had to suffer through Thomas Hardy in high school. I'll bet you did too. And Thomas Hardy, you know, the fascinating thing about Thomas Hardy is that he lived until like the 1930s or 40s or somewhere in there. And when you read his novels, you think they were written in like 1526. 
I mean, there's no, never electricity or, you know, plumbing or like modern conveniences. I mean, look at Far From the Madding Crowd. Far From the Madding Crowd is like the, the ultimate example. There is a chapter in Far From the Madding Crowd called The Road to Casterbridge. And what happens in The Road to Casterbridge is this. There is, you know, Far From the Madding Crowd is about Bathsheba Everdeen, who rides a horse around, and that's how you know she's independent, because she rides, like, bareback by herself. And she's in love with a guy named Troy. And Troy was supposed to marry a woman named Fanny. But Fanny is a complete idiot. I mean, she's just an idiot. She's very sweet, of course, but she's an idiot, which means that Thomas Hardy is going to do everything he can to torture her to death. I mean, he makes Puccini look sexually healthy. He really does. And Puccini was a sadomasochist when it came to torturing young girls to death for love. That is nothing compared to what Thomas Hardy has in store for Fanny. Because what happens to Fanny is she goes to the wrong church when she's supposed to marry Troy. She just goes to the wrong church. She's an idiot. And so she misses her own wedding. And so he doesn't feel he has to marry her anymore. So he can take up with Bathsheba, right? So, so Fanny is now, and Fanny's pregnant, of course. I mean, of course she's pregnant. She's pregnant and she's alone and she's destitute because she's pregnant. So, of course, she's been turned out of everyone's house and she's been been left to die in the street because what else are you going to do with an innocent, sweet, lovely, pregnant woman? Hmm? So what's happening? Well, she is near giving birth and she's completely, you know, starving to death and it's cold and it's windy and it's raining or whatever it is. And she's on the road to Castor Bridge to go to the poor house. And she's walking down the road to the poor house. And, you know, as she's walking down the road to the poor house, she's too proud, of course, to ask for like a lift. And there isn't anything to give her a lift. I mean, apparently nobody lives near Castor Bridge and there aren't things like cars. They have like horses and buggies and she's not going to ask for a lift and and she's trudging down the street and coming the other way who should turn up but Bathsheba Everdeen who sort of looks at her and quizzically and ignores her and just drives along and Fanny finally is so exhausted that she can't walk any further because she's very pregnant and she's she's you know near death and she crawls she starts to crawl on the road to Castor Bridge to the poorhouse. It could not be more pathetic. And as she's crawling, eventually she's delirious and she crawls into a ditch. And she's lying there in this ditch and still struggling to get to Castor Bridge, this, this stray dog comes up to her and she grabs a hold of the dog. I mean, you just, it's like one fabulous, unbelievably imaginative form of debasement after another. So she grabs the dog and the dog drags her to the poor house so she can give birth and die in childbirth. Actually, they both die. The baby dies and she dies. Of course, you can't have, you know, loose ends like that. So they're dead, right? So now that she's at Castor Bridge and she's dead, she has to get buried. And in order to get buried, she has to go back all the way she came to the churchyard for poor people, which happens to be sort of next to Bathsheba Everdeen's house or near there. And so what happens is they hire a guy. I mean, now she gets a ride now that she's dead. It's fascinating, isn't it? She's dead. The baby's dead. They have no problem finding a guy with a wagon to load a coffin into. And they go, they go chugging back the way she came. Well, the guy who's driving the wagon happens to be an alcoholic and he gets drunk and he falls asleep and he has to leave them somewhere for the evening. And whose house do you think happens to be on the way? Well, it is Bathsheba Everdeen's, naturally. So he parks the coffin in Bathsheba's barn and Bathsheba comes and has to, him. she's a curious lady, she has to see the body because that's what people did back then. And so she opens the casket and there is Fanny lying there with her beautiful golden locks artfully arrayed around her, her corpse. And Bathsheba notices 
that the golden hair is exactly the same golden hair that she found when she was snooping around in Troy's locket or watch fob or whatever he had, where, you know, in those Victorian days, people kept samples, you know, samples of body parts and things, and it was disgusting. So she had seen this golden hair, and so she, she sits there and sees that it's Fanny, and she knows who it is, and so she gets, um, like, some flowers, and she artfully arranges them around Fanny's head, because she has nothing better to do with her life, and closes the coffin, she goes away, and the next day, they continue on their way, and they bury Fanny. Well, you'd think that would be the end, wouldn't you? But it isn't, because at the corner of the churchyard where Fanny is buried, they plant flowers, and Bathsheba plants flowers, or someone plants flowers. There is a gargoyle. The gargoyle is a rain spout in the shape of a gargoyle in the corner of the church. So they bury Fanny, and they plant flowers all around her grave, and then there's this tremendous storm, and it, the water comes gushing out of the water spout, and it immediately uproots all the flowers and washes out Fanny's grave. And this occupies a whole bunch of chapters. I mean, the gargoyle alone is a chapter. I mean, and it just you just see Thomas Hardy sitting there thinking to himself, how much more miserable and degrading can I be? Yes, that was his object, and he succeeded admirably. And believe me, that was far from the madding crowd. You do not want to get me started on the subject of Tessa the Durbervilles. That's a story for another video. So why am I saying any of this? I have no idea. It's just a good story. But Finzi liked Thomas Hardy's poetry. And I have to say, after reading all these desultory novels, I didn't even know the man wrote poetry. I couldn't imagine the man writing poetry. It must be awfully grim. And it is. And so Finzi set a whole bunch of Hardy things, including this, this song cycle, I Said to Love, and Let Us Garlands Bring, and Before and After Summer, and some of these are Hardy poems and some aren't, but I Said to Love is some song. Let me tell you. I mean, it, it, it has the wonderfully poetic line, All Mankind Must Cease or something, to some sort of cheerful, optimistic thing. It's a very interesting song. It's, it's wonderfully declamatory and dramatic. It's almost like an operatic Shana. It's, it's, it's splendid. And so we're going to listen to it. It's with Roderick Williams and Ian Burnside, or Ian, or I-A-I-A-I-A-A-I-A-N I -A -I -A -I -A -A -I -A -A Burnside at the piano. And it's extraordinary. So let's listen to I Said to Love. What do you think he said to love? Ha! Take that, love! So here it is. I said to love, it is not now as in old days When men adored thee and thy ways All else above named thee the boy, the bright, the one who spread a heaven beneath the sun, I said to love. I said to him, we now know more of thee than then. We were but weak in judgment when with hearts a brim we clamored thee. That thou wouldst please inflict on us thine agonies, I said to him, I said to love, thou art not young, thou art not fair, no elfin darts, no channel bear, no swan, no dove are thine, but features pitiless and iron daggers of distress I said to love Depart then
It's a great song, truly a great song. So that's Finzi, and with that, we're past the halfway mark, and we can wrap this up rather hopefully quickly before I, you know, bore you to tears. So more Britain folk song arrangements and more Vaughan Williams, The Songs of Travel, The House of Life, and four poems by Fredegond Chauve. How do you like that name? You know, Mr. and Mrs. Chauve sitting there at the birth birthing place, wherever that was, saying, Darling, let's name him or her or it Fredegond. More Finzi, Earth, Air, and Rain to a Poet by Footpath and Style. Again with Roderick Williams and Ian Burnside with the Sacconi Quartet in this case. And some of these are accompanied by string quartet. That's what's nice about this collection, by the way. It isn't all just piano. Uh, you get you get other alternative ensembles, which are wonderful for a change of pace. And then we have Finzi Volume 3, A Young Man's Exhortation, Till Earth Outwears, and O Fair to See. These are great songs. They're just great songs. I mean, the declamation is perfect, and the poetry really, really allows for some marvelous musical settings. Even the dismal stuff by Thomas Hardy. And then we have William Alwyn. Isn't this nice? You know, Alwyn was really a fine composer. He's most famous for film music, at which he was absolutely splendid. We'll be talking about some of that, too. Don't worry. But here are his songs. Mirages, a song cycle for baritone and piano. Seascapes for soprano, treble, recorder, and piano. Invocations and the six nocturnes for baritone and piano. These are lovely. And they're world premiere recordings um, sung by like all kinds of people. We don't have to get, go into it. And we have John Ireland, five poems by Thomas Hardy. We know who his big student was, don't we? Finzi, yeah, sure. And a bunch of other songs by, by um, you know, Ireland, who was really, a, again, a good composer. And if he hadn't been such a chronic alcoholic, he would have been an even better composer. But these are very good. And again, these are Roderick Williams and Ian Burnside. And then we have Ivor Gurney, oh, the ultimate English pastoral Kai composer. Although I did have a friend when I was running WJHU in Baltimore, the uh, classical radio station, who was, you know, he did nothing but write little faux English pastoral songs. And his favorite composer was like Robin Milford. And I just looked at him and said, Robin who? Well, anyway, Robin Milford is not in here. You have to deal with Ivor Gurney. So that's fine. And then you have to have Butterworth. And Butterworth is not a brand of maple syrup. He's a composer. And let's see, he was from, let's see, 1885, 1916. He was one of the you know, composers who died in World War in World War I. And he wrote songs from a Shropshire lad. You know, his famous piece is The Banks of the Green Willow. He could have been something. He was talented. He was a real serious talent. It was a terribly, terribly sad thing that he was killed. But he wrote a bunch of songs from a Shropshire lad, along with everybody else. And then we have... Venables, Ian Venables, who was born in 1955, contemporary composer, quite admirable to have some world premiere recordings, more of them, of lovely music. So Venables is worth listening to also. It really is. I enjoyed it. And then here's some more Britain, the Blake songs, and Tit for Tat, and some more folk song settings. There's like millions of them. And this is with Roderick Williams again. And then we have, let's see, Dove. One quarter cleansing cream. It simply can't dry your skin the way regular soap can. Actually, that's Jonathan Dove. He was born in 1959. 
and and these are a bunch of song cycles, world premiere recordings, um, Out of Winter, Cut My Shadow, Ariel, and All You Who Sleep Tonight. And this is with Claire Booth and and Patricia Barden, and let's see who's playing the piano. Um, Andrew Matthews Owen is the pianist, and Nikki Spence is the tenor. So that's interesting. And finally, more Britain at last. The complete Scottish songs of Birthday Hensel. Who are these children? Question mark. Good question. Anyway, that is the 25th and final disc in this amazing, and I mean amazing, unbelievably comprehensive, imaginatively assembled, beautifully produced collection of English songs. And I, I really, you know, it's, it's taken me literally like six months to get through this collection because I really wanted to hear it. I mean, I wanted to actually listen to it like carefully. I really did, and I didn't want to, didn't want to feel pressured to do it either, because I'm not naturally a leader person, if you've seen my video on the leader problem. I would prefer to listen to rock or popular songs more than anything else than, than classical art songs most of the time. And, and the truth of the matter is, I, it's like the Bach cantata schlep. I need to be in the mood. And I was only going to put myself in the best possible frame of mind to enjoy this series. But I have to say, it, it didn't take much to get me there because this is really, really good stuff. A beautiful, beautiful collection, nicely boxed up, nicely annotated. The lack of text is terrible, I, I, I admit, but at least most of the poems you'll be able to find easily enough, I think. And actually, you can understand the words pretty well. I mean, having understood them, you may wish you hadn't, but that's another issue, isn't it? So keep on listening, folks. Do consider the English Song Collection. It's a major, major achievement that you are not going to find anywhere else in the, at the same exalted level of quality, I assure you. So, you know, what can I tell you? Great stuff. Thank you for joining me. Take care.